I welcome you all to the lecture number 15 of the course titled Psychology of Emotions Theory and Applications. So, today we will be starting module 7 and module 7 is about understanding emotions and cognitions, how cognitions and emotions interact with each other and uh, the, the different phenomena, different concepts associated with the both the concepts and their interactions we will be talking about in this module. So, this module will have three lectures. Uh, today we will be talking about the first lecture and uh, it is overall like lecture number 15. So, today we will kind of introduce the concept or on the relationship between emotions and cognitions. So, uh, just to give you a brief recap of what we did in the last module that is module 6 was about group emotions and in that we have discussed how emotions are expressed, experienced in the group situation and in that context we have discussed group emotions where they collectively a group of people experience emotions and we also discussed emotions on behalf of a group that is sometimes simply simply because of our identity or membership to a group uh, we experience emotions based on whatever positive or negative happens in that group accordingly we experience emotions so we try to understand by various concepts associated with all these concepts uh, and we also discussed that you know that when uh, we kind of include ourselves with the, within a group or have a membership with the, with a particular identity with a group, then naturally our my group and the other group also emerges. So, in that context, a uh, lot of these emotions that are generated within the context of group can also be directed towards the other group, which may uh, kind of explain a lot of conflicts and other things that happens when there is an intergroup kind of interaction situations. Uh, we also specifically discussed in the context of uh, emotions about other group, uh, we discussed the concept of prejudice and stereotypes which are basically uh, prejudice more about emotions and attitude towards the others or other group, other individuals or other group based on their membership to certain group. Stereotype is more about certain generalized beliefs that we have about other people based on their membership to a group and so on. <coughs> So, we have discussed the different causes and different factors associated with all these things in the last module uh, using two lectures. So, today we will be talking about cognitions and emotions and in today's lecture we will be talking about the effects of our interaction between cognition and emotions, how cognition affects emotions and the vice versa, how emotion affects cognitions. Uh, so, we will be talking about different concepts associated with all these things. We will be also talking about emotions, how it influences, in influences attentions and perception, attention and perception. So, we will be talking, uh, covering all these aspects in today's lecture. So, let us start. So, throughout the history, uh, emotions have been viewed as a threat to reason. So, th there is a general idea that uh, when people are emotional, then their rational part is not functional. So, they are not able to think properly. So, kind of this is looked at like like rationality and emotionality they cannot kind of coexist together so this is kind of approach that lot of people take from ancient philosophers like plato and aristotle to modern times so we'll we will we will try to see what is the truth behind all this is it like true fact or or not so we'll be try to understand all these things when we say that emotion can impact cognition so when we say that emotions can impact cognition it seem, it implies kind of implication is that you know these are two distinct system one is impacting other however there is a debate on this also it's that whether these are really independent systems so this distinction between emotion and cognition is kind of debatable in both philosophy and psychology are they really very independent system impacting one another so according to some theories such as descartes and jezong emotion and cognition refers to two independent systems some theorists kind of kind of in favor of the uh, view that emotion and cognition they are two independent system in the brain where emotions can occur before cognition and influence it. So, both can kind of independently work uh, in their own system or in their own ways. So, some uh, kind of theories believe that. On the other hand, uh, some theories like Lazarus argues that cognition precedes, you know, some believe that emotion can precede cognition and uh, some cognitive theories like Lazarus argues that cognition precedes emotion, means your thought processes, your perception, attention, this thing actually comes before the emotion happens or emotion is experienced. 
and according to uh, this concept that emotion cognition is necessary for emotion to occur without cognition emotion cannot happen. So, we have kind of discussed some of these aspects also through the theories of emotion in the first module, first uh, you know uh, few modules where we have discussed the theories of emotion in detail, where we have discussed the cognitive theories and some of the other theories that talks about emotion is more important and it influences cognition and uh, some theories like cognitive theory says cognition is fundamental and then it in it kind of causes emotion. So, it is debated whether emotion and cognition are so there is a not a clear cut idea in the uh, in the literature and it is debated whether emotion and cognition are independent system and if so which one occurs first whether emotion occurs first or cognition occurs first. So, there is a different group of researchers who are kind of taking different viewpoints. So, it is a kind of still debated topic. Uh, Strokebeck and Clore also some of the research are actually kind of suggest an kind of intermediate viewpoint which says that it is more accurate to say that emotion and cognition are interdependent system rather than completely independent system. So, this is uh, this is this probably could is much uh, more much more in line with a lot of evidences. So, it is better to say probably they are interdependent system rather than saying they are independent system. So, in fact, cognitive processes can alter emotion as cognitive reappraisal can affect emotion uh, which emotion is experienced. Furthermore, emotion can also influence regulate cognitive processes in various ways. Both can influence each other. So, that is the actually if you look at the evidences, uh, we will kind of in this lecture try to give evidences for both the direction that cognition can influence emotion and emotion can influence cognition. So, here we are using the cognition is as a broad term which includes your thinking, your perception, attention, all the th mental processes kind of broadly called here as a cognition. So, mental processes and emotional processes, this is how we are kind of uh, defining here with, with the term cognition more like mental processes, all the mental processes you know are collectively called here as a cognitive processes. So, let us see uh, first how cognition affects emotions, how mental processes can influence emotions. I think some of these evidences we have already looked into the cognitive theories of emotions in first few modules that we have discussed. Let us see a little bit more here. So, it may be considered evident that perception is a prerequisite for emotions such as anger, happiness, fear implying that their experience depends on how an event is perceived and interpreted. So, the basic idea here is that when we talk about cognition affects, affects emotion, the basic idea is very clear here that, uh, that without cognition how can you experience emotion. So, certain at least basic level of perception is required to experience emotions like happiness, anger or fear. In order to say I am happy, you have to have some perception of the environment or the stimulus which gives you happiness. Without really judging the environmental aspects, how can you experience emotion? So, that is the thing, the basic level of perception is required which is a cognition and depends on how an event is perceived and interpreted. So, based on the perception and interpretation, the emotions are experienced or the which emotion will be experienced depends on your perception and interpretation. Although emotion can have other origins behind uh, besides cognitions, some theorists believe that there can be some other origins also. For example, you know, people like Jezong and other they also talked about startled response. If somebody makes a very loud sound suddenly besides you, you will experience certain emotions of fear and other thing which may bypass cognition. But those are kind of very, very, very basic kind of thing. Uh, but according to a cognitive theorist, cognition at least basic level of cognition is necessary for experiencing emotion. So, it is unquestionably a significant and perhaps the most common factor contributing to emotions. A lot of evidences have also been kind of uh, uh, shown in favor of this idea. Uh, some studies investigated the cognitive cause of emotion, cognitive causes of emotions and have provided valuable insight into this subject matter. For example, one of the study, uh, one of the earlier study in the cog cognitive perspectives of emotions was done by Lazarus and Alfred in 1964. They conducted a study uh, to examine 
how cognition particularly appraisal contributes to emotion, how your thought processes, your judgment or your interpretation appraisal processes contributes to emotion. So, we will see this experiment very briefly how they did it. So, this we will just summarize the experiment the major part the broad aspects of this uh, study. So, this study included university students and uh, the task was that they watched a short anthropological film. So, it is a small documentary kind of film was shown to them, uh, where uh, the subject matter of the film was that circumcision of adolescence boys. So, circumcision is basically it is a kind of ritual uh, followed in certain religion, where you know foreskin of the genital organ is kind of cut. Uh, followed in certain religion like you know in Jews and Islam and others uh, some some religions boys in an African tribe. So, that film depicted this ritual and the boys whoever in that film their facial expression which indicated pain, fear and all these things were blurred. So, face was the expression was not visible how they are experiencing this ritual that was kind of blurred in the movie and it was shown. Uh, to these participants and there were two different conditions. So, there are two groups of uh, participants and each group were given different information. So, the condition was that participants were divided into two groups and were given different information. The all the, the film was same for both the group could see the same film, film the content was very same only thing the instruction was given different. So, in group 1 what was the instruction given? In group 1, they were told that they would see a painful circumcision uh, ritual that the adolescent had feared for months with no support provided to the boys during the ritual. So, that was the kind of instruction given by the experimenter to the participant in the group 1 condition. So, they said it is a very painful, but it, it was not visible in the uh, video because it was blurred in the face. So, but it was said that this is a painful process and uh, this boys actually feared for months. They had a lot of fear for these rituals and they were not provided any specific support during the ritual. So, that was the kind of instruction. In the second group, the instruction was that the ritual was something that the boys had been looking forward to and for long time and that experienced elders in the tribe would offer support and help to them. Here in the group 2, the experimenter gave instruction which is kind of different from the earlier group and they said this for this ritual they were not kind of afraid and fearful those things were not told to them. They are said they have been looking forward to this kind of there was a sense of eagerness what, what will happen. Uh, boys have been looking forward for a long time and a lot of uh, experienced people in the tribe they did gave support and helped them during the rituals and you know whatever support was necessary. So, the, the, the just the instruction was different same film was shown to both the groups. So, after the watching the film the participants uh, emotions were tested using physiological measures. So, different physiological measures like skin conductance and maybe heartbeat and so on. So, different physiological measures were measured and also a questionnaire was also kind of used to measure their subjective experiences during and after the film. How they felt and all these kinds of were also measured using a certain questionnaires. So, what was the result? The result showed that the film led to very different emotional response to both the groups. Both the groups had seen the same film but simply the instruction was given different and that different instruction led to completely different emotional experiences for both the groups. So, group 1 showed very clear indication of arousal on physiological measurement. So, they were very kind of fearful and kind of physiological arousal was very high and they reported experiencing negative emotions such as fear and anger during and after the, the film. So, they experience fear and anger during and after the film. So, they experience a lot of negative emotions which was evident in their physiological measure as well as their subjective report also. And this group was instructed that you know uh, the instruction was if you see the instruction was very clearly said that they would see a painful process uh, for which these boys in the film they had been fearing about this process. 
and there was no support given. So, accordingly they experienced emotion. For group 2, in terms of the measures, they showed only very slight indications of arousal. There were little bit arousal was there in the physiological report and they reported positive emotions such as happiness or interest during and after the film. Second group completely the, the different emotional experiences they experienced. They experienced happiness and interest and they were eager to know what is happening. Simply because they were instruction was different. In the group 2 in the instruction was that the boys had been looking forward to this ritual and support was given to them. Just this instruction stimulated positive emotions and when it was said that boys were fearful for these rituals and no support was given, the participant experienced negative emotions such as fear and anger. So, the only difference between these two groups was the information provided before the film was shown, nothing else, all the other thing was same. So, what can be we conclude from this experiment that Lazarus and Alfred concluded that the information given to participant led to different in their appraisal of the film's content which in turn caused their emotional response. So, it very clearly shows how you interpret a situation that ultimately leads to emotional experiences. So, different interpretation led to different emotional experiences for the same film. Uh, so, that clearly shows that cognition plays very important role for the emotional experiences. Now, Lazarus and uh, colleague also kind of did a lot of research on this cognitive interpretation that is associated with emotions and stress and coping. So, according to uh, the, the last study that we kind of discussed, Al Lazarus and Alfred study and their interpretation have inspired a range of different theories and studies that fall under the category of appraisal theory. So, appraisal theories are basically those theories that looks into the impact of cognitive interpretation on emotional experiences and some of the theories we have already discussed and Lazarus, Lazarus is one of the most prominent researcher in this area. So, according to Lazarus and colleagues, so many other colleagues who also worked with him, uh, there are uh, two types of appraisal. So, broadly all the cognitive interpretation, appraisal basically means interpretation. So, appraisal basically means uh, interpretation. So, all this cognitive appraisal or interpretation uh, can be categorized as primary and secondary appraisals. So, in the primary appraisal which is an basically the immediate uh, classification of the stimulus as positive or negative. The moment we see anything in the environment, we judge whether this is a positive thing or negative thing. So, broad classification of the stimulus that has a potential for emotional experiences. So, that is called the primary appraisal. The first interpretation that we do when we see something, so that is primary appraisal. So, let us say uh, you want to, uh, you are going to face an interview. So, one will judge whether this is kind of positive or negative overall, you know, how do you see the situation, how do you interpret the situation. So, that will be your primary appraisal. Now, secondary appra appraisal happens after the primary appraisals, we can do different other kind of interpretations about the situations. We can see, we can attribute the cause and responsibility of the stimulus or event, why that a particular event is happening or what is the cause behind the stimulus that I am seeing. So, you can have many other interpretation associated with, you can also interpret the possibilities of coping in the new situation. So, if there is a situation where you know, certain threats are there or certain stressful situation is there, you can see will I be able to handle this situation, do I have the resources to handle the situation. So, that also comes under secondary appraisal. Uh, secondary appraisal may also include expectations about further events, after this what may happen. So, all these different other interpretation that comes after the primary appraisals are called as secondary appraisal. So, we can give more specific examples. So, so, this is the kind of diagram that shows the whole scheme of things. So, we see an event or a stimulus, you see something or event or a stimulus. Initially, we can see whether this is a positive thing or a negative thing. So, you see something like snake and you judge this is a threatening or a negative thing that I should be I should avoid it. So, that is a primary appraisal, you are appraising the situation as negative. So, that is the primary appraisal, negative positive. 
after that we can do many other kind of appraisal how should i deal with the situation why this this snake has come and all these kinds of interpretation can happen which may include the find out the causes responsibilities coping expectations and all this can be called as secondary appraisal and this may ultimately lead to your emotional experiences so this is something that is uh, uh, the whole scheme of thing according to the this cognitive perspective of emotion that we talk about so let's say just give an example uh, we have already kind of looked into some examples for example there's a scenario where you are walking in the forest and spot an animal amidst the trees you see some animals but you are not able to recognize that animal some animals you see while walking in the forest now this is a situation you will have lot of thought processes in the primary appraisal what you will uh, be doing in terms of interpretation you may sense or you may see or you may kind of appraise this is a threatening maybe this animal is dangerous so this animal is dang possibly dangerous is a primary appraisal so you are judging positive negative so initial judgment just to see the animal you can see it can be dangerous so that is your primary appraisal which may lead to many secondary appraisal then you may see uh, think about other things like cause of the animal why this animal is here what it could be uh, can i will i be able to um, deal with the situation or should i run away or leave the situation will i be attacked by this thing all this interpretation comes after once you say something is threatening many other things will come up so those are called be secondary appraisal all this may lead to the emotion of fear or you may have some other interpretation like you might simply say the situation is manageable even though i don't know this animal but i think this will not, this is not not that harmful animal it's manageable i can deal with this animal and uh, maybe the animal will flee just you know it will run away after some time you may experience some other emotion depending on that or that fear will be much less so depending on how you do all this primary and secondary appraisal ultimate the emotion the kind of emotion you will experience will be depend on that so all this some of these th things we have already discussed earlier also now so so kind of we have discussed now that how cognition is very important and it can influence emotions okay because we have already discussed more some of these cognitive theories in detail earlier also so uh so i think this much will be enough for uh, the understanding the impact of cognition on emotion now we'll be talk about about that the vice versa can also happen the emotion can also influence your cognition so that is the other part of the story that when we experience emotion it can influence our thought processes it can influence our perception it can influence our attention so today we'll be just giving more about some of the introductory ideas and the next lecture will be talking more on let's say how it influences emotion influences our memory and another lecture will be talking about how emotion influences our thoughts and judgments judgments and, and decision making so let's see how emotion can influence our cognition or thought processes or perception attention etc now emotion can also have a profound impact on what we notice what we notice what we remember and how we reason how we reason emotion can influence all these things it is the sometimes emotion leads you to focus on some 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 specific things we'll see some of the evidences some some it is the because of the emotional nature of the content we are able to remember something because a lot of emotions are attached to it or it is the emotion sometimes help us to take certain decisions in our life under the influence of emotion so we'll see some of these things in more detail so while some may advise us to keep emotions at bay when making important decisions some people say emotion should not come in the picture while taking decisions because emotions kind of biases you researchers have shown that emotion can be functional and lead to productive and useful thinking and action so it's not always that emotions are kind of adversely affect our thought processes emotion can also help us in taking decisions and so on we'll see all these evidences later the evolutionary approach to emotion proposes that emotions are adaptive emotions are adaptive because emotion in the first place they are they are there within us in the evolutionary perspective or sense they simply because they are adaptive they help you to survive in different different situations of life so that is why they are adaptive they are functional 
that is why you know uh, they have some purpose to so serve some emotions like fear for certain things like snakes keep us away from unnecessary dangers so if these emotions are not there probably will not be able to survive so it helps so emotions like fear and other thing help us to keep away from dangerous things and so on so they are functional in that sense you know so the impact of emotion on cognition may also depends on the type and amount of emotion sometimes so how emotion impacts your cognition or thought processes and the mental processes can also depends on the amount or the intensity of emotion you are experiencing so this could be one of the aspect the intensity of emotion amount of emotion can also influence your thought processes if the emotions are very highly intense or if they are very low they may have different impact on our thought processes so one of the laws that could kind of explain it he is called as yerkes dotson law uh, which has been applied in the different context the basic idea is that you know learning memory performance and reasoning are most enhanced under medium level of arousal or emotion so this the uh, law basically says in the medium level of stress or emotion uh, it has been applied in different contexts in the stress also and certain emotional context also that when the intensity is at the medium not very high or very low then the performance is best as compared to when the arousal or physiological arousal or intensity is too low or too high in both the context performance or our whatever performance mental performance or physical performance or mental functioning are best in the medium level of arousal or emotions so this is a kind of very broad generalization which may not uh, be true in every, every, every context but it's a have been found to be true in various contexts it suggests a mild or moderate emotion may help in reasoning and performance so this is how it is kind of shown graphically uh, that arousal level means when we experience emotion every emotion has certain arousal level so if you are very intensely experiencing emotion the arousal level will be very high if the intensity is low then the arousal will be low and performance quality is this side is the performance quality whatever performance quality memory functioning or performing some decision making and so on so the, the different types of performance quality indicators could be there depending on the nature of the task so this is where arousal level is shown so this basically shows the optimum level of functioning is in the in the mid level mid level of arousal so the performance is best highest at the mid level of arousal so somewhere in the mid neither very low very high and here two graphs are shown simply because in the context of easy task so this red one is easy task for easy task anything any task which is relatively easy we can perform best with when the performance le arousal level is little higher as compared to when the task is very complex so the idea is when a task is very complex the arousal level is at which we can perform best should be little lower because complex task requires lot of concentration and other thing so little higher arousal can disturb it but we can perform best even for doing simple task even if the arousal is little higher so it shows this arousal level could be little higher for the optimum performance in for the simple task but for performance of a complex task the arousal level should be little lower even in the medium level what we are talking about for complex tasks it should be little low and for simple tasks the arousal level can be higher because it is simple not much effort is required even at higher arousal we can perform our best now this is something we all have understood simple task we can under very difficult situations also we will be able to perform but complex task requires a lot of attention little bit of higher arousal can disturb it so even though that also requires optimum level is the best but the comparative to simple task the arousal level has to be little less so that is the whole idea so the impact of emotions on cognition has diverse if aspects and researchers have examined the effects of emotions on attention memory reasoning decision making separately so some of this thing will be discussed separately in the other lectures so this lecture will be focusing more on some of the broad theoretical principles which can explain the role of emotion on cognition <clears throat> so 
In that context, we will be discussing three major perspective or theoretical perspectives which can kind of explain the role of emotion on cognition. So, we will be talking about emotion or mood congruence as a phenomena which can explain how emotion can influence cognition. We will be talking about feeling as information theory which also can explain how emotion can influence cognition and the last we will be talking about styles of processing can also depend on the kind of emotions that we experience. So, we will see these three thing, three aspects one by one. So, what is emotion or mood congruence which can explain the role of emotion on cognition? Emotion or mood congruence refers to the phenomena where an individual's current mood or emotional state influences the way they perceive, remember and process information. So, your current emotional state can influence what you remember, what you perceive or how you process the information. So, whatever emotion you are feeling now, that feeling can lead to different type of cognitive processes which are congruent to that emotion. Just the way emotion, the depending on the nature of emotion, the cognition, cogn nature of cognition will also be determined. So, if you are feeling happy, in other words, people tend to recall and interpret information that is consistent with their current mood. So, according to your mood, you also experience or kind of recall information. If you are feeling happy, you are more likely to remember happy things in your life. If for example, if you are now happy or if you are now sad, sad will stimulate all the sad related information in your mind you are more likely to remember all the negative things in your life. So, your current emotion will kind of stimulate congruent information or congruent, con congruent cognitive processes. So, they are more readily available uh, than the information which is incongruent. So, incongruent means if you are feeling sad, most probably you will not happy information is less likely to come to your in mind because it is incongruent to the present emotion. So, that is the idea of mood congruence that emotions can influence cognitive processes and uh, the there is a congruence between them. The nature of emotion that you are experiencing, the nature of thought, thoughts and information that you are recalling will be very similar or similar nature will be there. So, in that sense how emotions can influence your cognition. So, in that context, there is one theory which also talks in detail about this whole mood congruence thing or emotion congruence. This is Bauer's associative network theory, which was kind of proposed in 1981. So, Gordon Bauer theory says that emotions and moods are linked to associative brain network, where memories that are congruent with the current emotion state becomes more accessible and easier to retrieve. So, there is an associative network of information in the brain. And similar, the, the emotions and the informations, they are all connected to each other and they are kind of encoded in the brain depending on the nature of emotion, nature of information and all this. So, once an emotion is activated, it will activate similar nodes of information which are, uh, which are kind of encoded while in the similar emotional state. So, whatever thing was kind of uh, perceived or kind of encoded while you are experiencing sadness, in the future when we experience sadness again those information will kind of get stimulated because they are connected through networks of through certain associative networks. So, they will be connected. So, there is an associative brain network where memories that are congruent with emotional state. So, emotional state and the memories of informations are kind of connected to each other congruent information. So, if positive emotion arises all the informations which are connected to the positive emotion they will get activated and they become much more easily accessible and easier to retrieve. So, that is the basic idea. So, these memories are those that have been encoded with a similar emotional toll in the past. So, when we are sad, we kind of encode lot of information under that emotional constant. So, next time when we experience sad again, those emotions which were encoded under sadness will get activated because they are connected, associated with each other. For instance, if a person is feeling sad, uh, the memories of past sad experiences or situations are more likely to be activated because they are associated with each other in the network of information. 
So, when a person experiences an emotion, all the association of that emotions become more accessible. So, emotions are associated with different information depending on how they are encoded, all this will become more accessible and accessible means more congruent information and this association contribute to the interpretation of the current event. So, you are more likely to interpret the present situation based on those past information that were activated because of the emotion. So, Bauer also proposed that material or the content congruent with one's current emotion is better learned or remembered because it is integrated into active memory structures and more easily retrieved. He also said, uh, if you are learning something in a under particular emotional state, so they will be kind of uh, whatever material or content if you are learning them and if they are congruent with your current emotional state, uh, you will be able to better learn them. For example, they kind of tested this hypothesis uh, is that you know found that participant who were induced to feel happy and sad while reading a story about two college students. So, some student uh, were induced feeling of happiness, some were induced feeling of sadness while reading some story and later it was found that, that they remember more facts about student doing well or poor. So, those who were in the state of happy mood, they remember more about what the student did well in their life in that story. The, all the positive information became much more accessible, they, they could recall them much more better ways when under happiness they, they were reading that story. On the other hand, the student who were in the sad state remember more of the bad things or poor things in their life uh, in the subsequent memory test. So, this shows that we learn things which are congruent to the emotions better ways. So, however, research has since found that effects of emotions on memory and cognition are very complex. Obviously, this is one of the ways more generalized way of looking at it that emotion can trigger congruent informations and we are more likely to remember them. A lot of other complexities could also be involved, uh, could be involved also. For example, there are instances when memories that do not match one's current mood can also be remembered effectively in some instances, then those do it align with it. In certain cases, even incongruent memories have also been found to be remembered effectively in certain context. So, this, this, this idea of congruence is still very important uh, in the research of emotions, but a lot of these mechanisms that Bauer proposed men are not very well established and some researchers challenge those mechanisms that not everything is like you know the way they have mentioned it as an associative network may not be true in, in many contexts. For example, one researcher Macaulay and Ryan put it, let us say two individuals, one happy and other sad are shown say a rose and asked to identify and describe what they see. So, let us say two individuals under two different emotions and they are shown rose as a neutral kind of thing and asked to identify and describe what they see. Both individuals are apt to say the same thing and encode the rose event in the same manner. Now, the instance of rose here, whether the person is under happy emotion or sad emotion, they are likely to encode it, encode this rose in the same manner. This may, in this context, emotion may not have much influences here, for example, you know, whether you are the sad or, or happy, things like rose and something will not be really of much impact because of the emotional content of it. Memory for rose event will probably not appear to be mood dependent under these circumstances. However, in certain circumstances where you know individual recalls personal life events, personal life events, mood influences do indeed exist, but they fluctuate due to the distinctiveness of people's experiences. So, in some contexts, mood or emotions can be very effect, very influence the content of it especially when we remember autobiographical memories or our past life incidences, emotions can play a very important role. But then again, there will be individual differences. Some for something like neutral objects like rose, emotion may not have much influences. So, there are different complexities that are associated with it, which Bauer's model is has not really looked into. So, this uh, each and uh, Macaulay also concluded based on a lot of this evidence that mood dependent effects on cognition such as memory and perceptions 
are influenced by various factors including the task performed by the participant, the mode induced and the characteristics of the participant. So, there may be many other factors that can influence this whole thing. So, to address that another uh, another theory was proposed uh, by uh, which is called as uh, by Forgas which is called as an effect infusion model. It also tries to explain the similar thing as uh, how emotion influences cognition uh, just like the Bowers model with a little bit of modification just to address some of these problems. So, this model says uh, how mood and affective state influences cognitive processes, judgment and decision making similar purpose. Uh, the mood suggests that uh, this model suggests that effect or emotions can infuse or impact various cognitive processes leading to changes in information processing and decision outcomes. So, emotions can infuse the cognitive processes. So, whenever you experience certain emotion it kind of get infused with the cognitive processes and lead to many changes in the outcomes of cognitive processes. This model also proposes that, that this impact of emotion on cognition person is not uniform. This is where they kind of try to address some of the problems of the Bauer model. They say this, this effect of emotion on cognition is not uniform everywhere. It re depends on various situational factors such as whether somebody is present or not, emotion expressed by others, how others are expressing the emotion, the kind of type of task you are doing, whether you are performing a simple task or complex task, emotions will have different impact. As we have already seen in the complex tasks, probably emotion will have much more impact. So, it is kind of modification of Bauer's model which suggests that emotion influences cognitive task, particularly if the task is complex, emotion will have much more impact. For example, happiness may infuse positive evaluation into judgment task, certain complex tasks, judgment tasks, if you are happy probably it will change your evaluation into more positive direction. So, this finding suggests that emotion can influence cognitive processes in a very complex ways which are not entirely explained by the Bowers model, but some of these are a kind of taken care by this effect infusion model. So, these are this is one way where we can understand the impact of emotion on cognition. Second theoretical perspective is feeling as information, how it can influence cognition. So, Clore and colleagues basically were uh, proposed this idea where they, they gave a second approach to understanding the influence of emotion on cognition is that effect as information or emo emotion as information. It suggests that emotion can provide important information when we make judgment. So, when we make any decisions, we will be taking little bit more detail about this also while talking about decision making process. So, when we make any decision or judgment in life, emotions, whatever emotion we experience during that process it provides some information to us what to do. So, there is an information value of the emotion. So, that is the gist of this theory. So, there are two uh, certain uh, hypotheses associated with this model is that you know emotion serve as a signal providing information about our environment or situation. So, emotion gives a signal. So, if you are experiencing anger, it is a signal that some injustice has occurred and need to be addressed. So, a lot of e this in emotion that we experience gives a signal that you know what is happening in the environment. Fear gives you a signal that there is a danger. So, all these emotions provide some information to you and it helps you to make decisions. So, when you see experience fear, you feel that there is a sense of danger and you take decision I should run away or something like that. So, many of our judgment are too complex for us to review all the relevant evidences. So, we rely simple assessment based on our current feelings. Many times we cannot take all the accounts of a situation to take a decision because it is too time taking and it may lead lot of effort. So, sometimes we take shortcuts using the emotions as information and take decisions whatever emotion says. Many people say I decided based on my gut feeling. So, this, this is like you know I have not really looked into every aspect of it, but what emotion said I took decision accordingly. So, those those are basically instances where it shows that emotion can uh, help us to take decision quickly in many com complex situations. So, in case of let us say evaluating political leader for instance, some research shows that we re often rely on our gut feelings about persons rather than weighing all the evidences. People really do not do all the complex 
evidences of what positives and negatives people generally use gut feelings to take decisions. So, these gut feelings are basically they are using emotion as information to make a decision. So, Clore and his colleagues argued that emotion can be very useful heuristics rule of thumb that can be used to make judgments or take action as they often work better in random guessing. They are better than random guessing because emotion is saying you something and it helps you to make decisions sometimes. So, this perspective challenges the assumption that rational thought is always the best approach to decision making. Rational thought is important, but in many time emotion can help you to take decisions. So, that is why you know just judging that emotions are kind of bad for taking decisions may not be true in many, many, many instances. So, research has shown that emotional state can influence judgments even when the objects are evaluated or unrelated to the source of information. Sometimes source of emotion could be very different something else, but you are taking decision in something other some other context can also be influenced by the emotions of other things. So, your emotion arose in some other context let us say your emotion arose in your family life. Now, it is influencing your decision making in your work life. So, source was, was different but it is impacting in completely different situation. So, positive and negative moods have been found to affect various judgments including consumer item evaluation, political leader assessments, assessment of losses and gains, everywhere emotions can influence your decision making. Positive emotion generally leads to positive evaluation, negative emotion leads to negative evaluation. So, it is generally as simple as this. Moreover, moods and emotion also affects judgment of the future also. So, many times while taking decision about some future thing also moods emotion also influences those decisions. Negative moods tends to make people view future pessimistically. So, let us say you are in a negative mood. Generally, when we feel negative, uh, we our future also looks very dark. When we feel happy, joyful, our future also kinds of looks bright. So, our future decisions, future also the tone changes according to the emotion. So, in a study by Johnson and Tversky, the participants were induced into negative mood by reading newspaper articles about young man's death. So, negative mood was induced. People in a negative mood judge negative life events such as contracting a disease to be more likely to occur in the future. So, under the negative mood, people judged about some future possibilities more negatively like likely likelihood of contracting a disease people overestimated. So, like that emotions can influence your future judgment also. The third perspective that uh, can be kind of related to emotions impact of emotion on cognition is called style of processing. So, another alternative perspective is suggests that the different emotions and moods lead to different cognitive processing. So, your emotions could influence how you process the information. What is the style of processing? affecting how individuals reasons weight evidence and draw conclusions. So, this cognitive psychology has identified two systems of thinking style. These are called system 1 and system 2. So, let us see uh, what are this system 1 and system 2. System 1 is very automatic, intuitive, fast mode of thinking. So, many time we are uh, we think and take decision very fast it is very automatic, intuitive and fast mode of thinking. It operates very rapidly, involuntarily, very kind of automatically, relies on heuristics, very automatic, not much of conscious thought, thought processes goes into it. For instance, when somebody asks what do cows drink, most people instinctively can answer if they are using system 1, uh, milk, uh, they will say milk because they associate cows with the milk. But here the question was what do cows drink? This is an example of system 1 because if you immediately say cows drink milk, uh, they drink milk because you associate cows with the milk. So, if, if you do, do something very automatically, the answer may be milk. On the other hand, system 2 is a very deliberate, analytical and slow mode of thinking. When you think process consciously, think about pros and cons and so on, then the system 2 is activated. It engages in uh, more effortful reasoning. In the same scenario, system 2 may lead to response may be more clear and correct response such as cows typically drink water, but calves may drink milk. So, this is a very uh, answer which has some conscious thought processes involved in it. So, there are two systems, one system which is very automatic, rapid, 
most of the time may be very unconsciously response and system 2 is more deliberate analytical involve more detailed processing so we take decisions sometimes under system 1 sometimes under system 2 so these are two different styles of processing both system has their own strengths and problems both have their pros and cons sometimes system 1 helps you to take uh, decisions very quickly but it can be error it can be full of errors and system 2 can uh, require a lot of efforts which you may not be able to do or because of too much of efforts we are not uh, likely to do in most of the time both system 1 and system 2 uh, thinking play crucial roles in our cognitive processes system 1 allows us quickly navigate familiar situations while system 2 enables us to handle novel and complex tasks require deeper thinking and analysis. So, both have their own strengths and applications in different situations. So, this is a very uh, popular book, one of the best selling book called Thinking Fast and Slow by one of the Nobel laureates, Kahneman. Uh, he talked about these two systems in detail in that book. He discusses various research conducted uh, with his colleagues Amos Chebaski. Uh, who uh, showed that people people's heuristic response often take over when presented with problems that require deliberate thinking people generally take this system one which is much more easier and intuitive uh, it takes over mo most of the times the system two which is more deliberate because that requires a lot of effort although the the, uh, the deliberate system two can also override system one it is often requires effort and sometimes very lazy we are lazy we do not want to use system 2 in most of the time. As a result, people often prefer to rely on system 1 which is quick and system 1 is used more in the decision making. Now, these emotions are attached to each of this uh, processing style. Our emotional world is what allows us to make decisions quickly. Many times, this system 1 is linked to emotions where we take decisions very quickly using certain intuitive gut feelings and so on. Without emotion, how could you know what is important? It is emotion that helps us to determine what is important and accordingly we take decisions. So, according to research, positive moods tend to promote the use of heuristic thinking. Also, the, the, what kind of emotion you are experiencing also determines what kind of system you will be using. For example, the positive mood tend to promote use of heuristic thinking that is system 1, while anxious mode can facilitate deliberate thought processes which is system 2. So, not all emotions will lead to just system 1. Some emotion can stimulate system 2 like when you are very anxious, people want to look into the pros and cons and so on, and then system 2 may also get activated. So, emotion can influence both the processing style depending on what kind of emotion you are experiencing. Negative emotions mostly like sadness and anger can also have different effects on thinking style. So, anger can have different effect sadness can have also different effect on processing styles. For example, uh, this study uh, found that people are less likely to rely on stereotypes when feeling sad. When people are sad, they do not use stereotypes that we have discussed in the last class. So, generally they do not use too much of system 1. Stereotypes are system 1 related processing. So, sad people generally do not use much of system 1 processes as compared to when feeling angry. When when people feeling angry, they are more likely to use stereotypes and more of system 1 type of processing. So, stereotypes are more heuristic judgment that we have already discussed and more likely to be used when one is emotional state such as happiness, anger. People are more likely to use stereotypes when they are happy and also they are angry. So, happiness, angry, these emotions are more likely to lead to system 1 kind of thinking and more specifically in the context of stereotypes. So, thus emotion can influence the type of cognitive processing we engage in. So, emotion can influence what type of cognitive processing style we are using. Now, little bit we will be talking about here about how emotion can influence our attention and perception very briefly. A uh, lot of evidences support the uh, common belief that our emotional state affects how we perceive objects and events in our environment. Emotion affects our attention where we put our attention, it is guided by our emotions. So, emotion have been found to shape perception, where you see what you kind of look at, uh, what we attend to and how we perceive it. Our environment has so many information, we cannot pay attention to everything, 
but we selectively look at something and this selective attention can be guided by our emotions. Now, emotional objects capture attention. If any object is associated with some emotions, we are more likely to give attention there. Emotions kind of catches our attention. We all know it you know, from our day to day life also. The emotional objects are more likely to capture our attention than neutral objects. Studies have shown that our emotional reactions to stimuli occur very quickly and often before we are even aware of them. We attend so many things are there in our environment every time, but we attend to only few things and one of the reason is that on we our attention automatically goes to the objects which are associated with some emotions. There will be some emotional value to it. Sometimes unconsciously the, our attention goes there. Once we have an emotional reaction, we automatically direct our attention towards the object, likely because it is important to us, because emotion says that something is important. So, our attention goes there. This increased attention towards the emotional object allows us to become more aware of their presence and location in our environment, enabling us act accordingly. So, emotional object that elicit positive emotions can also capture attention, like joy also capture attention. But objects that are perceived as threat or elicit any object that elicit negative emotions like fear or anxiety that captures our attention more than the any object that elicits positive emotions because negative emotions are very important because they show something is dangerous or so your life may be at risk. So, for survival perspective, negative emotions are more stronger and more attention grabbing. This phenomena has been observed in various attentional tasks such as troop task and many other experimental setup also. That objects including human and schematic faces, images of objects and words uh, that you know people with you know, all kinds of experimental setup where all these things have been you showed that negative attentional face or any objects where there is a possibility of negative attention captures our attention more. For example, studies have found that people detect threatening faces more quickly than friendly ones in a crowd of neutral ones. So, if there are so many people having faces, where the faces, uh, there, if there is a threatening, threatening faces, we capture it more as compared to even positive or uh, faces as compared to the neutral ones. So, this is for example, one study was conducted here in the left side, if you see there is a threatening face among all the neutral faces. So, if you look at this picture automatically your attention will go to this face. All the other neutral faces will not have your attention because this is a threatening face. Here if you say there is a one face which has a kind of you know uh, uh, friendly face which is little different friendly face among the neutral ones. Obviously, among the neutral ones this will capture attention but this captures much more attention quickly than this one. So, threatening faces takes less time to attend to as compared to even uh, friendly faces and other faces. So, that is the kind of experimental evidences also shows. So, objects that elicit emotional reactions are able to capture attention rapidly even when our attention is limited and diverted by relevant objects. Even when we are not able to pay attention, emotional object will capture our attention more. Fearful faces for examples are more efficiently detected than neutral ones even when presented for only 20 milliseconds on a computer screen. People could even detect fearful faces even a very short sp span of time it is presented. So, once we direct our attention towards an emotional object it becomes difficult to disengage. So, it will have some impact and we will process that information. People in the state of anxiety or fear are even more likely to attend to threatening stimuli. So, if you are in the negative state of emotions, you are more likely to attend to negative stimuli, more likely because your present emotion is also like this and it is more likely to be congruent in terms of detecting other emotions, which similar emotions or negative emotions. So, this finding align with evolutionary theory, which suggests that emotional reactions to threatening stimuli we are na naturally selected for survival purposes because this has a survival value. Threat and negative emotions poses an immediate danger. So, people attend to that automatically our body and mind is aligned like that. So, that we can protect ourselves and it helps us to survive. 
So it's important to note that neutral objects can also capture attention in a similar way if associated with fear. So that's very interesting. Even if a neutral object is associated with a fearful object, our attention can, can be captured by neutral ones simply because of its association with the neutral objects. So it could be, let's say, you know, some, for example, somebody uh, can be, you know, met an accident with a bike or something. So bike could be a very neutral thing, but since it is associated with an accident, probably the next time when you see that those bikes will have much more fear reactions and attention will go there. So those kind of when a neutral object is associated with a fear or some kind of fearful stimuli, they will at also kind of attract more attention simply because of their connection with the threat and uh, some negative emotions. Now, and the last the thing is that emotion also influences not just what we pay attention, but to what extent we can pay attention depending on the type of emotion we are experiencing. So, our emotions can affect not only what we pay attention, but also scope of attention. We have already discussed about the positive emotion, which says the positive emotions broadens our attention. So, we are able to pay attention to more number of objects and stimuli in our environment when we experience positive emotions. As compared to that, when we experience negative emotions, most of the time our attention becomes much more narrowed down and we are able to pay attention to only few things. So, according to research conducted by Eisen and Fredrickson, positive mood can promote more flexible creative thinking, aid in the formation of important social bonds and broadens our resources. We have already discussed in detail about these things in the positive emotion lecture. So, we all will not repeat that here. Now, research also shows how high arousal negative emotions narrows our attentions, particularly emotions which are highly arousal like anxiety and so on that narrows our attention as compared to positive emotions which broadens our attentions. So, this is come something called as a Q utilization hypothesis which suggests that individuals attention becomes restricted to central cues while disregarding the peripheral ones. So, under negative attention high arousal we only pay attention to the central most important thing and we are not about paying attention to any peripheral things. Further research has also confirmed that attentional narrowing can result from negative experiences such as when we experience stress, when we experience electric shocks, simulated danger, exposure to negative facial expression, all this can narrow down our attention because all these are associated with negative emotions. Narrowing of attention has also been uh, applied to have many applied implications such as weapon focus as a concept which refers to the decrease in the memory for details of the perpetrator of a crime by an eyewitness due to the capture of attention by the weapon. So, it basically simply says mostly in the crime situations, people who are in the witness situation, they only focus on the central aspects like weapon if it is very visible. Uh, so, that the, the, from there this phenomena came called weapon focus which refers to decrease in the mem memory because people forget about other things, but they focus on only the central aspect of that situation. So, this phenomena occurs because threatening stimuli tend to capture and hold people's attention, especially in a threatening or crime like situations where weapon is the most dangerous thing you know. So, the whole focus goes there, attention narrows down to the weapon only. So, making it difficult to process other information. So, you forget other things and focus on only few central things. A study conducted by Kramer and colleague uh, in 1990 found that participant who watched a video of a mock crime scene with a highly visible weapon recalled significantly less details of the perpetrator. They could not detail uh, report much about the people who did crime and other thing in that mock setting because their whole focus was on the weapon. So, that is weapon focus kind of phenomena. So, under negative emotions, our attention goes nar narrows down to the central aspect only. So, interestingly, this influence of emotion on attention scope may be less related to balance and more on arousal. So, positive negative also influences no doubt, but arousal is more important. If the negative emotion is of high arousal, like people become highly anxious, then this narrow down happens much more. Herman Jones and colleagues found that emotional state with high levels of motivational intensity, intensity when it is very high such as uh, desire for disgust narrows attention focus compared to the neutral states 
while emotional state with low levels of motivational intensity regardless of their balance broadens attention. So, obviously positive negative can also impact, but most important is the arousal level. If negative emotion is of high arousal nature, it activates your body much more than the narrows, narrowing of attention happens much more prominently as compared to the balance aspect or positive or negative aspects. So, these are some of the important things uh, about introductory concept between how cognition and emotion can interact with each other and affect each other. So, this was more introductory lecture and the next lecture will be talking about more specifically how it impacts our memory and decision making. With this I will stop here. Thank you.